new series this morning. I'm still trying to figure out the name of it, but it's going to be um, a series on life. We're going to be going through, I believe, uh, parables that Jesus taught um, beginning this morning and going throughout, and I don't know actually how long it's going to take us into this season, but the title of, of my message, the sermon this morning, is A Love Worth Living, um, and we're going to be talking a little bit from, from the Gospel of Luke, the namesake of my son. So if you guys can turn to Luke chapter 10 this morning, and we'll uh, pick up reading. We're going to be reading from verses 25 through 37. And then also, I'll be reading from Colossians 1, a couple verses there. So if you guys can get those two ready, I'll also have them on the screen for you. I'm going to be reading a little bit about the Good Samaritan this morning. You guys like that? Yeah, so we're going to be helping out with the, the baccalaureate service also. My wife mentioned that. I just had a meeting with Pastor Inadeo and uh, another representative from the school. Um, so we're going to be trying to head that up. Um, and so hopefully you guys can make it. I don't know. Are you going to be walking in that? Are you going to be involved in that? Or do you know? Baccalaureate service? That's what you have to do. Like if you want someone to commit, it's like you just call them out on the carpet. Just get the mic. Praise the Lord. That's one benefit, I guess, being able to get up in front of people and speak. But anyway, so we're going to be going from uh, the, uh, talking a little bit about the Good Samaritan this morning. So Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37, um, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into things this morning. So Luke 10, 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So the lawyer answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Verse 29 says, But he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing. Wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came... Sorry, I lost my place. Hmm? I heard like a whisper or something. I was like, what? Someone tell me something. 31, now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. 33 says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now in Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 21 through 23. And it says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this time of just uh, being in your presence in worship. I pray, God, that you would uh, move upon us this morning, that you would help me to communicate what you want to be spoken, that you would anoint me, and you'd anoint all of us here, Lord, so that we'd be hearers and doers of your word. I pray, God, that you would continue to work in our hearts and knit our hearts together as one, and that we would continue to fall deeper in love with you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys like games? Like board games, playing card, card games, other different types of games. My, wov- my, my wife loves playing games. We, uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple Fridays ago, we had a thing called Family Night. It was our first one. Um, we had an all right 
amount of people kind of show up that night. If you guys missed out, missed it, you guys missed out. It was lots of fun. It was supposed to go from 5 to 7.30, and I think we actually stopped at 9.30 because there was a, a big game of taking over the world that had to finish, so we waited, and Tyler, Tyler finally won that. But, but me, myself, I, 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 I'm not really a big fan of, of games, of board games for the most part, um, mainly because, personally, um, for myself, the main reason why I don't like games is not because I'm legalistic or anything like that, but for the main reason, I just don't like to lose. I don't know if there's any other sore losers out there. I'm kind of a sore loser. If I play, I want to try and win. I want, I want to be able to win. I don't want to be, you know, have the, the nice face with other people. Oh, good job. That was fun. Yeah. And then go home and complain and, you know, and hit the kids and get mad and just kick the... I don't do that, but, you know, just, just being mad. I don't like to do that. But, but I think for some of us, we, we love playing games, but the only way we like to play games is maybe trying to get around the rule, so to speak. I don't know if any of you guys are like that. That's the only way I like to play games, is maybe by you know, trying to bend the rules a little bit to, to try and to get an advantage on the people I'm playing against. Some of you guys might call it cheating. I don't necessarily call it cheating, but you know, trying to, to be able to outdo the other person so that I have an advantage. You know? that's, what I'm, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to do. So usually, I know that cheating is bad, and, and I used to cheat a lot in a lot of different things, including school. But um, that's one of the reasons why I don't want to want to play because I know cheating is bad, right? Cheating is bad. I guess if you say that, cheating is bad. So what I try to do is I try not to play. I, I come Friday nights, I'll come to family night, and I'll watch. And I, like, I enjoy watching people play. So I usually, that's what I do is I usually watch people play games because I don't want to get emotionally attached and emotionally involved in something that is, you know, is, is just so finite, so beyond me. But, but in, in reality, I know that my old sin nature is going to come back. So not playing is actually how I submit my old sinful nature from not coming up and coming out so that other people would see that, you know what, I don't think this guy is really sanctified. And I know that, come on, you guys, I know that you guys are, don't, don't, don't look at me like I'm so unholy. I know some of you guys. I've talked with some of you guys, Right? But one of the games that, that, is, that, that kind of is one of the, the games I really don't like is Scrabble. How many people like Scrabble here? You have to be a word person to like Scrabble. And usually the people that play Scrabble are usually the people that when you play a game, they have the rules memorized and they have the page number of the rules of the rule book actually memorized. Those are the people that usually play Scrabble. I'm personally kind of one of those guys. It's like, you know, I'm, I'll make up a word. You make up a word. We'll all make up words. We'll just have fun with it, right? We'll just, like, no, 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 no. I challenge that. Bring out the dictionary. That, you know, that's the type of people that play Scrabble. But I'm like a guy that's no blood, no foul kind of person. You know, like, come on, we'll just, come on, we'll just have fun with it. One game I do enjoy, and I don't know if you guys have played this yet, is called Balderdash. Has ever, anybody ever played that? It is a fun game, and I'll tell you why. You get, these, you get these words that come up, and you have to make up your own definition. And hopefully, your definition is worded properly. It's good enough to where other people will guess your definition of it and think it's right, and that's how you win the game. It's pretty much showing how good you can lie and how good you can cheat and how good you can bluff other people. So this game is right down my alley, right? But it's funny to see some of the games, how they've progressed through the years, because especially in our day and age, playing video games, everything like that, all of a sudden, in the last five, maybe ten years, there's been these things called cheat codes, where it's like other people that don't have whatever, the, the talent or knowledge or wisdom or money to buy cheat codes, they can't get to certain levels, but these people that have money, you can buy cheat codes. Even playing solitaire, sometimes I like to play solitaire on a device. I don't know if you guys get the apps for solitaire or Sudoku or whatever the case may be. But now solitaire has these things that you can cheat to play to win. They have x-ray vision, so you know which card is going to be under those. So you go, okay, well, I'll put that king into the open space because I know that there's another king and an ace and all this kind of stuff. Because I think one of the th reasons is, is, is that people are trying to play to our weakness. They're trying to play to what we as humans like, and that is taking the, the path of least resistance. And that's what we see here in this story with the lawyer. He comes up to Jesus, and he asks him a question. And I love how Jesus has dialogue with people. 
Usually when someone, and he knows he's going to get tested by certain people, rulers, priests, Levites, Pharisees, Sadducees, whatever the case may be, when they come up and ask him a question, how does he usually respond? It's by throwing a question right back at him. I, I want to try and, and work this somehow how into my daily routine. When someone asks me a question, I'll just return the question back at them to really see you know, what, what's going on with them. So he comes up to, to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what, what is, how can I gain eternal life? How can I get this eternal life? And so Jesus turns it back on him. He's like, well, you know, for the most part, you're a lawyer. What's your reading? What's your understanding? What's your interpretation? And so the lawyer, thinking, okay, this is the time to shine in front of the crowd, in front of people, because this lawyer, he's not an actual lawyer that we know lawyer. The lawyer in these days were actually teachers of the law. They were the people that had the the first five books of the law, the Torah, whatever, uh, the Pentateuch, memorized, and so they were the teachers of it. So they were supposed to be the people that actually knew what the law was about. So Jesus challenges in in this. And so he's like thinking, you know what? This is my time to shine. This is who I'm going to show and, and just kind of show how much knowledge and how much wisdom I have in the Word of God or in the Old Testament, in this written law. And he comes back and he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus, I'm sure, he's smiling at this time, thinking, okay, go and do that, and you'll inherit eternal life. And I'm sure taking back, the, the lawyer's kind of like, oh man, starting to sweat a little bit. Well, Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Why do we see that? Why does he come back with this question, who's my neighbor? Why doesn't he come back, well, how do I really love God? I think for the most part, hopefully if I describe it properly, I think we can kind of understand why he comes back with, who's, who's actually my neighbor? Because I think for us, mostly, if we're all believers here, um, if you're not, we can pray for you, and you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to this morning, but... We know and have come to realize that, you know, God is the creator of all. God's the one that created us, right? He's the one that breathed into us. He's the one that sent Jesus to die for us on the the cross. He's the one that's given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. Of course, it's going to be easy to love God, right? Because God has done so much for us. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? My neighbor. My neighbor can be against me, right? What What has my neighbor ever done for me? And we can kind of... Be just like this, this lawyer and thinking, what about, well, well, who's my neighbor, you know? Who really is my neighbor? And so he comes up and he, he starts to ask Jesus this question. Because in reality, people, my neighbor, whoever it might be, are real. And they're real mean. And they're real ugly. And they're real weird. And it's just, blah, right? When we come across people. But how are we actually supposed to to love people like that? Because I know that their best interests aren't for me. I know that God wants the best for me, that he loves me with an unconditional love, but my neighbor doesn't, right? Because when we get out on the streets, our neighbor cuts us off. We go to the grocery store, we're like, okay, I'm going to get nine items so I can go in, in line that says 10 items or less, and we see someone in front of us with 20 items, right? And you're like, how could, what? The sign, what? Are you serious? What? I mean, that's, that's our neighbor, right? We come to the store in the middle of the night trying to get something for our wife and be loving and, and unconditional, just trying to get one thing, one, thing, one gallon of ice cream, right? And then there's people there. And so they have all this ton of, of stuff, and it's like they're shopping for the next year because they're hoarders. I don't know what the case But there's like, I just have this one thing, and i got to get home. I'm trying to get... But that's people, right? That's the reality of life because other people, they aren't looking for my best interest. But loving God, loving him, that's a no-brainer, right? That's something we know to do, and that's something we should do. And so he has Jesus right now in front of him, and he has this this FaceTime with Jesus. He's like, okay, so who is my neighbor? Who who really is my neighbor? What's, what's, What's the Greek definition of neighbor? What does neighbor really mean? And we can relate with him because it sounds tough. When, when, okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But that sounds difficult because I love myself. I love myself a lot, actually. And I have this thing sometimes called false humility where I try and pretend like I'm humble and have humility, and I try and pretend like I'm in a lowly state and try and just sit on the sideline but in actuality, it's pride because I don't want to step out and be hurt and let people see, you know, who I really am. So in actuality, it's some type of a self-preservation. It's some type of a pride. 
because I really love myself. But how can I do that to actually love my neighbor? Because loving my neighbor like that sounds pretty near impossible. We want to try and just get by as people. We don't want to really, we don't want the really, the tough stuff. Give us something, Lord, I know I can handle, I know I can do, but it'll look like I'm exerting a lot of energy, so when people actually see the good I do, they'll actually praise me. But don't give me something impossible, like really loving my neighbor, because that is like, I can't do that, right? I don't, I don't want to get involved with that. That's impossible. Okay, so, so who is my neighbor? People are, are really broken up. So, so he's looking for an out, right? The Bible says that he's looking to justify himself. In the message translation, it actually says he's looking for a loophole. How many times in our lives have we tried to look for a loophole in this Christianity that we're walking? How many times are we trying to kind of skirt the issue or walk around what really we know what God is calling us to do and calling us to live? But we're trying to find the easy way out. We're trying to justify ourselves. And and all of a sudden, we're trying to to continue on with this life. But God is calling us to do something else. It's like, you know know what, Jesus, I know, I know that, but I got a headache right now, and I I just can't do that. And my, my kids, I got my kids, and, and I'm just trying to keep my kids alive, right? And, and I, I don't want them to turn out like my neighbors, because my neighbors are messed up. So I don't want my kids to, to turn into them. I'm trying to, to be involved more with my kids. or You know, that, that's an admirable thing, right? What about my own circumstance? I'm trying to figure my thing out first before I can really pour myself into other people, because I, I, I got to fix my thing first. But, so we know exactly how this lawyer feels, right? We've all been there. So now that he's in front of Jesus, he's asking him, honestly, who is my neighbor? Is there something of a spiritual mystery behind the word? Or is there some type of metaphor that will be somewhat knowledge-driven and just like, hmm, that's a good thought. Hmm, man, that was really good, Jesus. But it doesn't produce action. How many of us have lived like that or have maybe heard a message that has convicted us, but by the time we've left the door, it's like, hmm, okay, well, okay, well, let's go to Via Senors or whatever it's called nowadays because they're under new management. So we then see Jesus begins to tell a story in Luke 10.30. Let me drink real quick. It says, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. This road would have been really familiar to this lawyer and pretty much all the people that were hearing in the crowd. It was a famous road, and it, actually took, it was actually about, I think, 17 to 18 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. And they say that it's actually 4,000 feet drop from Jerusalem all the way to Jericho, because Jericho was, uh, underneath, is underneath sea level for the most part. And so you could pretty much count on it being the, the climate change um, drastically changing by the time you left Jerusalem and getting to Jerusalem. Um, there was a lot of different things that were going on. It wasn't just a straight shot, but it was kind of a, a wavy, windy, treacherous road with treacherous terrain. And I guess it's still there to this day. I haven't heard. And people that actually ride on camels or ride on, on horses or mules or I think probably even cars, but they say it's still pretty crazy because when you see another person coming, it's almost like you're going to go off the cliff. And so it's pretty treacherous. And they say that there's a lot of caverns and a lot of caves along this road. And so what we see happened here, probably happened quite regularly. And that's what they said, that people were beat up. People, there was thieves amongst them, and that they would go out uh, on this road and actually beat people up, take all their belongings, take whatever they have. And it kind of reminded me, I don't know if you guys were here a couple weeks ago, but I went out on that graffiti paint out, and uh, we were on the north side of town, and some of the high school kids were in, in one of the alleys, and they're like, yeah, this is what they call Devil's Alley right here. It's like, if you're here in the middle of the night, you know something's going to go down. So don't ever go there. And I actually looked, looked up Devil's Alley. I wanted to try and say it in Spanish to sound cool, but I can't. It, was, it sounds cool in Spanish. It just sounds like tough, you know. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember that. But anyways, it's actually a place near Mexico City, and it's the same thing, right? It, it's just gnarly. And so this is what this roadway was. It was a place where, where you knew that people were going to get beat up. So it's like travel with, with some big guys, travel with whatever you got to be able to do this. So this was a road that actually went down to Jericho. And so we see that these two people, these priests and Levites, come on the scene, that these are the two figures that Jesus starts to talk about. One thing that, that would have been a regular thing that would have done uh, or have happened on the roadway is for Levites and priests to actually travel this road. 
Because when I was studying, I actually found out that Jericho at this time was actually a holy city. It was a residence for priests and Levites. They said there was about 12,000 priests and Levites in this city, including their families and relatives. So this was kind of where they resided. So this story is sounding true to the lawyer. So first thing he says, he's like, this guy, half dead, beat up. Everything's going on in him. You know, he's just having the worst day of his worst life. And so all of a sudden, a priest come down, and we don't know if he's, he's going to the city or going back down to Jericho to go home. But he kind of sees this guy in his need, in his distress, in his depravity, and he comes to him, and he kind of like sees him from afar, and he goes and crosses over the other side. And many of you guys might know the difference with priests and Levites. They're all, every, every priest is a Levite, but not all priests, or not all Levites are priests. So it's kind of, you got the priests that are the varsity team of the tribe of Levi, and then you have the Levites. They're all ministers of the gospel, but, but the priests were kind of the, the varsity team. They were the, you know, the televangelists and everything like that in, in, the, in, in the world. They were the superstars and, and the, of the athletes and stuff like that. And then the Levites, they were kind of, you know, the, the, the home church pastors, or whatever the case may be, but everyone was looked up upon. They were the holy men of their time, and so they were looked up upon. And so then the priest comes by, and he passes him by on the other side and doesn't want to get involved. And then we see the Levite coming down, and the same thing happens, and he gets involved. And one thing that I remember as, as I was kind of studying this out when we were studying in the book of Nehemiah was when they would have the different tribes of the Levites and priests, they would only minister once a week unless it was feast times, right? So here we see that these two guys, either, either they're going to work or coming from work, and they've just fulfilled their weekly duty for the year. And so they're kind of going. They're either going to church, they're on their way to minister, they're going to be a man of God but not actually be a man of God to this guy. Or they're kind of going home. It's like, oh, man, that was a great time of being in the temple. That was a great week. And, ooh, poor guy. I, I, I got to get home to my kids and my family. I just don't want to mess around. I don't want to become unholy or unclean or any, anything like that. And it's actually funny when I was studying is, is in the law, there's actually – several places in the law where it says that you're supposed to help people in need. You're not supposed to leave people on the roadside dead, or you're not supposed to, if you see, if you see a mule or someone's animal in a ditch, that you're supposed to go and help them. And these were the priests. These were the people that were supposed to uphold the law, and we see them that they're just passing by. So right now the lawyer's kind of thinking in his mind, okay, I know the law. I know that that's not right, but I know that that probably could happen because, you know, I mean, they're, they're the priests and the Levites. They can, they can do that kind of a thing. And so we see that they're kind of going, they're going alongside, and they don't even pass by him. Sometimes I wonder if, if we, as believers, if we as Christians, you know, and as Jesus followers, if we sometimes just pass by certain things that, that go on in people's life, that we come, we become too focused on principles and the logistics and the, and the definitions of something that we lose focus of people, that we're too focused on what I got to do, to stay holy, what, you know, what does this say, I need to do this, but in actuality, we're not able to open up and take off the blinders to see other people in need, that there's other people around us that are, that are depraved, that are half dead, that, that, that are needing this same gospel that we have, that are needing the same love that we've come into the realization, that, that can't sing a song, you're a good, good father, because they don't even know who the father is, they've never met him, they've never come into a relationship before, Right? And so God is wanting this for us. He's wanting to use us. And one thing that kind of came into my head was, a question was, did Christ come for the law or for people? Who did Christ actually come for? Was it for the law or was it for people? We can see someone where they are at, but never get to where they are at. We can see them, but never really go to them. Then Jesus continues on with the story and now enters the Samaritan. Luke 10, through 34 says, But a certain man, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Right now, more than likely, because many of us have probably heard different teachings on Samaritans and Jews, that there were probably some gasp in the crowd. There's probably, you know, some rustling, whatever the case may be. Because if you haven't heard, Jews and Samaritans, they hated each other. They were actually worse than Republicans and Democrats in the presidential primaries and, and probably talked a little bit more abusely. But there's, there's actually written in, in, in some of the oral traditions of, of the, the priests and stuff, we're saying that you could actually travel 
hundreds of miles or tens of miles around the Samaritans so you didn't come across them because they were unholy. And I won't get into touching on that because I know many of us have heard that, but to Jews, the Samaritans were a half-tribe with a half-religion that was mixed up with the world and everything like that. So we see that they kind of just like skirted the issue. But when Jesus starts to talk about a Samaritan, everyone, ears probably perked up and started listening, especially the lawyer. So we see that this Samaritan, he comes close and he has compassion on the, on the man. He doesn't come close, but he comes closer. And actually, it says in verse 30, in the, in so 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. So he came to him where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion, so he went to him. So it's like, how much closer can you be? Because you already came to him, but then he actually went to him. And that was one thing I, I just kind of thought of is like, we can come to people and be there, but have we really went to them? Have we really opened ourselves up to them? Because when he went to him, when he opened himself up to him, that's when his resources became the half-dead man's resources. That's when he opened himself up, was when he actually went to him to help out, to open himself up, to be like, you know what? This oil, my bandage, these different things I have, they're meant for me, but I'm going to open myself up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to him. And he went to him, and he opened himself up and used the same resources that were for him to be able to meet the needs of this guy that was laying on the ground. Now that is compassion. And then he put him on his animal. So that means that this guy had to actually walk the treacherous terrain by himself, on his foot, holding his mule with his man on it. And then they found an inn and continued to take care of him all night. That he stayed with him. He didn't leave him at the inn, but he stayed with him all night. Luke 10.35, on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay. So we see that he pays him, pretty much what they say is it's two days wages, and at that time, many people, theologians are guessing that it would have actually been about two months, the amount of money that two denarii was for an inn and for someone to take care of him, which is crazy, two days wages. It's like, I can't even get a hotel room for two days wages anymore. But it's, so it's Luke so then we go in and see Luke 10, 36 through 37. It says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer, he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So we see that Jesus tells him to go and do likewise. And I'm sure the lawyer is, oh, he asked me another question and I have to answer this. And I'm sure we see just even in here that the lawyer doesn't even have the nerve. He doesn't even want to say Samaritan. So he just says, he who had mercy, he who showed mercy, that he couldn't even bring himself to say that. And we know that the lawyer is smart. He knows the law. And he's well studied and versed and probably even had it memorized. And so he understands really what Jesus says, go and do likewise. Because he knows what the law requires. It means to go and do 100% of the time, batting 1,000 that you're to go and do. Never mess up. And then you will really love your neighbor. But we know that it's actually impossible. And that's why I believe there's no response at the end. It just ends there, and then all of a sudden it talks about Jesus going on to visit Mary and Martha. Because I think that the lawyer came to a place where he thought, you know what? I finally realized that what I know is actually impossible for me to carry out. That there's no way I can do it. Because in actuality, if you, begin, if you go back to the beginning of their dialogue with the lawyer and Jesus, he's asking, how can I inherit eternal life? In and of ourselves, we cannot inherit eternal life. There's nothing we can do. We can know what we're supposed to do. We can know the law, but we can't actually do it in and of ourselves. On the very best, be, best second of the best day that we ever lived, that we could never actually gain eternal life. And I think sometimes when we study parables, that too often when we read them, that we just try and come up with a social system or church programs to try and meet the needs of, our, of humanity and, and civilization. And, and we kind of come across and we see, oh, this, you know, the Samaritan and he's half dead. And it's like, try and read the story. It's like, well, maybe, you know, he's half dead. Is, is he half dead, mostly dead, or all the way dead? Because what do you do with the guy that's, 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 that's all the way dead? You go through his pockets and look for loose change, right? It's a movie. Sorry. Anyways, so they try and come up, you know, okay, we got to come together. What, what can we do? 
What can we do? Maybe the road, it's treacherous, it's windy. Maybe we should make it a little bit straight. Maybe we need to have a road program. Maybe we need to start giving to a program to, to create better roadways. And maybe we need to, to, to create better jobs and more jobs. So maybe the thieves will actually get jobs and earn a living and not have to, 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 to go back and fall back to a life of thievery. Maybe we can to build some more hospitals along the road, um, and which is all good. And I'm not, and I'm not you know, finding, prince, finding the things in here and like thinking and coming them up. But unless we have a heart for it, it's never going to produce the fruit that God is wanting. That it can all become legalistic. It all can be law. It can all just be focused on action. But when it comes down to it, to fulfill the law, like God is, is wanting us to, like Jesus is telling it, it, it's a heart issue. And in and of ourselves, I cannot love you. And in and of yourself, I know you cannot love me. Right? This weird guy. I don't know why he dresses like that. I mean, it's just weird, right? But through God, only that is possible. And we need to come to that realization that it's only through God's love, through his sacrificial, unconditional, agape love, that we can love one another, even when we call each other believers, even when we know we go to the same church, or we're, we're all Christians in the same community, that it's impossible for myself to love you. And I know it's impossible for you to love me without the love of Christ flowing through our veins. So I want to ask, so why is, are we as Christians trying to gain eternal life? Even though we know we can't gain it by ourselves, why are we as Christians still trying to gain eternal life by ourselves? Why are we still trying to go about our daily routines, our week-to-week habits, only living in our own faith, in ourselves, in our own strength, in our own priorities, with our own purposes, and maybe fulfilling the weekly duties of the year and thinking that's good enough for me, and going about our daily routine. What do you mean? I prayed a prayer. I was baptized. I was baptized twice. Tells you a little about my background. Right? But living a life of love requires living a life of faith. Is our daily lives requiring faith? Are we living our lives on purpose with God's purpose in mind? knowing that he called us and he's purposed us. He's redeemed us for something higher, not to go back to the other, the other way of life that we were doing, but just having a label on it. Are we as Christians, as believers, just living off the label of Christianity, of Jesus' follower without actually following Jesus, without actually having a relationship with him? Sometimes I think that we fail to see in the scriptures that these parables were actually used as a point of evangelism for Jesus. Sometimes we can overlook it and try and gain the principles out of which are good, and we're going to be doing that as we study parables. But we need to see that these were points of evangelism for Jesus and the people that were coming, for seekers to come and try and try Jesus and ask Jesus questions. And he tells a parable to them so that when they really gain the understanding of the whole parable as a whole, they're going to see in and of themselves, I cannot uphold the law. And I need someone that is greater than myself, greater than who I am, to be able to allow me to be able to gain eternal life. I need something more that I can't do and don't have the capacity of doing. What we must come to see is that Jesus is playing the part of the Samaritan in this story. And it's not about trying to figure out how he did it or what's the method this morning. That's not my point this morning. But if we reduce it to that, it will just become law. If we try and gain the principles of just the methods without the heart, it will just be another point of legalism. Amen? And it'll be all about the actions and not about the hearts. Because what we can see, if Jesus is the Samaritan then the priests and Levites, they're the law. The law can do nothing to me. It has no power over me. It can do nothing for me. All it does is it shows how ugly and sinful and dead I am in my own sins. That is what the law is to do. It came to show us who we are, to point to someone that was to come, who can be our Savior and who is our Savior, and that was going to make a way, even though there there seemed to be no way, but he was going to make a way for us to gain salvation. But it wasn't through our own actions, but it was through faith. Romans 8, 3 says, The law was without power because the law was made weak by our own sinful selves. 
But God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son to earth with the same human life that others use for sin. By sending his son to be an offering for sin, God used a human life to destroy sin. When we see Jesus, he came and he lived our humanity. That he died the death that we were supposed to be dead with. That he bore our sins that we were filled with. And that he passed through the curse that was upon us. That it was only through him that we could gain eternal life. It was only through him. And I want to ask, have we forgotten to fall back on Jesus? Or have we, sometimes when I was on maintenance, it was you're trying to train someone and, and they kind of brought me on board a lot of the time because the, the, the certain um, specific thing that I was trained in uh, skills was HVAC refrigeration. And my wife always like, why do you tell people that? Just tell them the whole word. Heating, ventilation, air conditioning, refrigeration. We were just over in Seattle and they're like, what's, what's that? HVAC. HVAC. I think I've heard that. HVAC. What do you do? It's like, anyways. But you kind of try and train someone. You're teaching someone. But then it's like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. And you can be on your way. I got it from here. And I wonder, have we done that with Jesus? Oh, thanks. Thanks for eternal life. Thank you. I prayed the prayer. I know my sins are forgiven, but okay, I got this on my own. And we try and go about life the same way we did without him. Have we left him in the past? So here we see in essence that Jesus is telling the lawyer, if you can live like me, you can inherit eternal life. If you can be perfect, you can have eternal life. And the lawyer gets it. And that's why I think it was a time of, for this guy to go off and pretty much start wrestling with himself. Some people will preach, oh, you know, he's in hell now or whatever, he didn't fall. We don't know that. And we never know. Even if we try and minister to someone, we don't know. We don't know what the end result of a thing is. Our discussions, our times, our points of, of, of meeting with people are supposed to be points of being able to engage people. Because we can tell them all the stuff that they're supposed to do and how you're supposed to live a godly life and that you need Jesus and everything like that. But unless it's an actual heart change in their hearts, they need to have time to actually meditate on giving their whole life to God. And we need to know that and not just be down on ourselves if you try and witness and it's like, oh, well, they didn't, they didn't accept Jesus. It's like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that takes all of your life. And so if someone doesn't raise their hand one morning, we don't need to be upset and just keep loving them and hopefully one day they'll have that in themselves, that moment of, aha, I got it. I finally got it. For me, I was raised in the church. For me, to get that aha moment where it's like, so that's what it means and I know I, I prayed a prayer when I was really young, and I was even baptized, and then I went off, did my own thing for about almost 20 years. And it was when I was 23 or 24, it was like, I finally got it. I was like, he wants all of me. And this life I'm living, I am not doing a very good job at it. And I don't want to end up like other people that I'm hanging around but I know that he wants all of me and that he has his great, greatest purpose and greatest passion for me. But so many times, even as we come into this, this life of a believer, we're still trying to redefine it. We're still trying to play balderdash. We're still trying to, to make up our own definitions as we go. We're still trying to, to skirt the issue that God has called us to or trying to find some backdoor passage to really loving my neighbor but not really loving my neighbor. In Colossians 1, 21 through 23, you say that we were at enemies and at war with God. It says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister so we see that we were at enemies with God. We were his enemy, just like Jews and Samaritans were. But he reconciled, he paid the price for us in our beaten, half-dead state by dying on the cross for our sins. And he took upon our sin, our worthlessness, and gave us worth. But we must continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel 
the question I want us to go away with from this scripture in Colossians is, have we moved away from the hope of the gospel? Have we taken up residence with the priests and the Levites in Jericho? And have we left the side of Jesus, the life that we're supposed to be following after? When he called his disciples, he said, come follow me. Are we following Jesus? Are we really getting to know him? Are we really getting to know his heart? Or are we just trying to find out the best way for me to live and that's it? Are we really wanting to know the true purpose of this love letter? To love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. But has it become too me-focused? Have we become so focused even on the destination of eternal life that God has actually called us to live eternal life right now? Are we too focused on, I'm just trying to get to heaven and that's all? Or do we really understand that eternal life is here and now? That when we accept salvation, he eternally rebirths our spirit and we become alive in a spirit. We have this spirit man this inner being that he's wanting to strengthen and encourage and to walk out of our, our own flesh and our own nature and our own abilities to walk in a new level of grace into his ability, into his resources, in his love and in his mercy, which we could never do in of ourselves. It's only by him that we can live this life, this Christian life, this following of Jesus' life is by spending time with him in prayer, spending time with him in his word that he's given, this love letter that describes him in every facet, in every scripture, in every, in every, every chapter, every, every book. It describes him. And he wants us to know him because that's the only way. It's not about social programs. It's not about church programs. It's about knowing Jesus Christ, the one who saved us, the one who loved us, the one who called us with a mighty calling, And when you get to know him, then you will actually have that infusion of love to love others. It's through that. That's the only way that you can have love for for others. Not even people on the outside or people in the world or pre-Christians, whatever we want to call them. But to really love my neighbor, to love the people here inside this church, I need it by spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, spending time in fellowship with him, but also spending time with his body, which is the church. And sooner or later, you're going to be... I'm a bro, I'm a dude, and you're a dude, but I want to give you a hug because I love you. It's something weird. I, don't, I can't explain it because in actuality, it would look weird if I wasn't saved, but I'm saved and it's all right, right? And all of a sudden, we're not trying to push our way around people any longer. We don't see them as obstructions any longer in a grocery store, but instead, we want to spend time with you and, and get to know them and, and really want to fellowship because I really want to know how you're doing. I want to know what you're going through. We all want to know what you're going through so that we can really pray for you and encourage you and love you and see you fulfill the calling of God that he has for your life. Are we coming together as the body of Christ? So that real love. So one question I have, my final question this morning is, have you lost hope? Is there hope in your life right now? Because if there's not, I'm wondering if if you've moved away from the faith, if you've moved away from this life that we're supposed to be living and just trying to do it on yourselves. So the worship team comes up. I, I want to open up the altars. If you feel that you've moved away, if you feel like you no longer reside at the side of Jesus, but you've moved away to just trying to better yourself or or being focused on, on my own needs, that, that, that I know the circumstances that come in life and they just flood you and they overwhelm you and that's what the enemy tries to do is he tries to just pour on everything. He tries to pour on the struggles. He tries to pour on the, 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 the financial instability. He tries to pour on getting your kids mixed up in drugs and getting your kids mixed up in the wrong crowd and getting your kids mixed up and, and, and seeing them not live the life that you taught them to live. And you see your spouse not really loving you anymore. And all this kind of stuff starts to overwhelm us. And it's like, God, do you really love me? Do you really have my best interest in mind? But God has created a vessel for his love to be revealed. And that is the church body. They will know us by our love for one another. 
have a love for one another, that we're willing to go the extra mile with one another, we're willing to open up and share our resources with one another because we know that I know you're going through some stuff right now and, and I have this. Do you need it? I'd love to watch your kids for a, for a weekend while you and your husband maybe get away and try and hash some things out and be real with each other. Are we willing to, to do life together? Because this love... This love is worth living. And I don't want to live a life without it. So as we go into this song, I want to invite anyone that, that's going through some stuff right now, that's going through some hardships, and you need a brother or a sister to come alongside you, to bring comfort, bring encouragement, that we can pray through some issues. And maybe you've moved away to where maybe you need to repent of some certain things that you've allowed into your life that has caused separation from your relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we go into this song, we can sing now. If you would like to come forward, I just want to invite you forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for what you're continuing to do in our lives. We thank you that you're drawing us closer to you. We thank you for your love that you have poured out upon us, that we can look to the cross and know your love and experience your love, Father. And I pray for each and every one of us here and even for others that call this place their home church, Lord, that they would come to experience your love and know your love and continue to feel it coming through this relationship of the church body, Lord. I pray for your love to overwhelm us for your grace to be infused inside of us so that we can love each other even though we know that we have no ability or no capability to love one another but that you would give us the love that we need, Father. Because we can't keep doing this life on our own. We can't keep doing church out of our own strength and our own ability. We need your love. We need you, Holy Spirit, to infuse us to love one another and to love you above all things, Lord continue to show us. We thank you, God, that your love would go beyond our own knowledge, our own ability to comprehend into a supernatural experience with you. We thank you, Father. We thank you so much for calling us into this church. And I thank you, God, that you have many great things in store for us to accomplish that you're still wanting to use us, you're still wanting to, to, to bring us into a new level of worship and intimacy with you. I pray that you would open our eyes to see beyond ourselves, even as a church, and that you would continue to give us that heart of compassion where we'd open ourselves up just like you portrayed yourself in the Samaritan and start to give of your own resources. We ask for those resources, God, as we continue to give out and to pour out into the community, Lord. We love you, we praise you, we glorify you, Lord. Pray that you would speak great blessings to each and every one of us here. And that everything we do, think, and say would be glorifying to you. That we would glorify you with our lives on a Sunday morning and even on a Wednesday afternoon. Every day, Lord, that we would be able to glorify you. We love you, we praise you, we glorify you. We thank you for our time here this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name.